It was May 1998 at the deli, the bread basket in Oak Park, Michigan. There's a whole group of us, and we sat in the back section. The extended family was in town visiting for a special birthday, so the meeting place had to be a good Jewish deli. The meal included blintzes and pickles and some amazing deli corned beef on double-baked seedless rye, the kind with a rock-hard crispy heel, something I think maybe you can only get in Detroit. There may have been some kishka, latka, matzo ball or two. I don't quite remember. The conversation at the table was a heated debate between Jeff and his cousin on whether or not celebrities have a responsibility to be good role models. Jeff asserted they do. His cousin, they do not. And I agreed with Jeff. There were many memorable moments that we can all agree on. But when they insisted that it was lunch, I knew they were wrong. Jeff's father, Harold, and my mother, Andra, of blessed memory, were with us when we met for the first time. We all shared that meal together in the deli, and then some of us gathered after to watch the Detroit Red Wings play in the Stanley Cup Finals. It was mere weeks before I left for Jerusalem, and as I left, Jeff said, see you in five years. I knew there was no way I would wait five years to see him again. And the rest, as they say, is history. While we didn't know it at the time, our meeting at that deli was a momentous occasion. Jeff and I know that we met over dinner. Our parents were sure it was lunch. Unquestionably sure. So sure they included the detail in their speeches at our wedding. I have often wondered about this. Clearly, it was either lunch or dinner. It could not have been both lunch and dinner. And as sure as Jeff and I are that it was dinner, I'll tell you they were sure it was lunch. And while it really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things how we remember it, it's fascinating to consider the gift of memory and how our minds work. I recalled this personal story and the ongoing debate about the facts as I looked at this week's Torah portion. This week, we start the Torah from its beginning, Parshat Breshit. It's a narrative that we are all familiar with, the story of God creating the world. The first chapter of the book of Genesis depicts a day-by-day -day creation where God speaks the elements of the world of creation into being heaven and earth, darkness and light, land, sky and sea, and on and on and on. On the sixth day, God summons the earth to bring forth every living creature. After creating wild beasts and creeping things and cattle of every kind, God says, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And we read, God created him. Male and female, God created them. And we read that God blesses them and tells them to be fertile and increase and to fill and master the world. And on the sixth day, God seems so pleased with the work of creation that it is deemed very good. Interestingly, just a few verses later in the Torah, we seem to be telling something quite different, a different version of the creation of the world. That when God made heaven and earth before anything was growing or living, God created man from the dust of the earth, blowing life into his nostrils. This second telling depicts God's planting a beautiful garden and creating a river to water that garden and placing a man in the garden to enjoy it and eat of its growth and to care for it, but to avoid one single tree and its fruit. God recognizes that man is lonely and creates all the animals in an attempt to find a fitting partner for the man, but is unsuccessful. Only when God creates another being from that man's body is he able to find a true partner for the man. Each of these narratives offers a different lens into creation. Perhaps it's a different memory, a different mechanism for the mind to know, to understand, to make sense of circumstance. Had I asked
asked each one of you to give me a brief synopsis of the creation of the world as we read about in the Torah, I imagine I would hear about the days of creation. Maybe I'd hear about Shabbat. I'd probably hear about Adam and Eve. I'd probably hear about the garden. You see, our own memory of the text would combine the two narratives together into some sort of combination story, one that picks and excludes details based on what interested us when we last read it or learned it, or one that resonates with the details that seem most identifiable or for us maybe even believable. One way we can understand the Torah is that it's the attempt of our ancestors to make sense of their lives and the world around them and to answer the big important questions of their time and to record their experiences and teachings for the next generation. No wonder when we read about the creation of the world and human beings, there is not just a single narrative, but two detailed tellings that likely inspired larger groups of people. Every single experience that we encounter is understood, remembered, and recalled from a unique perspective. That is our own perspective. Our minds translate and interpret stimulus in similar but not identical ways that other minds do. Our minds do this work of interpretation in a way that serves us individually in a maximal way. This may be taking care of our ego, comforting us or protecting us in some way. I'm suggesting that as we begin reading from the Torah, the first words again, we're powerfully reminded that writing down and recording our experiences is the richest way to preserve them and share them. Glucal of Helm was a 17th century Jewish businesswoman and a diarist. Her memoirs, written in Yiddish over the course of 30 years, were originally intended to be an ethical will for her children and future descendants. Glucal's diaries are only known pre-modern Yiddish memoirs written by a woman. About her own work, she described them so. She said, I am writing down these many details, dear children of mine, so you may know what sort of people you have sprung, lest today or tomorrow your beloved children and grandchildren come and know not of their family. Rabbi Karyolitsky suggests that the details are the stuff of life. In a thoughtful essay in his book called Sacred Intentions, Olitsky writes, how do we learn where we come from? Some of us may have heard stories from parents and grandparents which anchor us and, let us hope, continue centuries into the future. If we forget our family and our people's past, we become spiritually orphaned, for no one exists in a vacuum detached from the particulars of their past. Rabbi Olitsky correctly asserts that each of us asks existential questions at some point in our lives. Why are we here? Who came before me? How is my life connected to the past? How did my family end up here? Is there wisdom in my people's past to guide me? When these questions arise, we ask others and more life experience to help us understand the inextricable intertwining between our lives and our history. Rabbi Alitsky reminds us that in order to have a vision for the future, we have to acquire a knowledge of and a perspective on the past. Just as we search out repositories of our own past, so too will we be called upon to assume this role for future generations. We are the ones who anchor our children and grandchildren's questions in a rich past in hopes that they can have a meaningful future. On this Shabbat, as we begin the book of Genesis, let us dive deep into our sacred text and discover kernels of detail that shed light and knowledge on our lives, customs, beliefs, and struggles of our ancestors. May we be inspired and instructed by Torah, and may we embark on a process to record and recount our own experiences as a gift of history we share with our dear ones to help them chart their way towards a bright, healthy, and rich future. Yes, I am sure it was dinner. Shabbat shalom.